Films in Focus with David Sterrett is underwritten by The Movie House, your destination for first-run Hollywood and independent movies, and a digital portal to the Met Opera, National Theater Live, and special events worldwide in Millerton, New York, and on the web, themoviehouse.net. David Sterrett is the editor-in-chief of the Quarterly Review of Film and Video, contributing writer at Cineast, film professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art, Robin Hood Radio's very own critic who always has something up his sleeve. He joins us weekly. The film's... The Fablemans, Pinocchio, and All the Beauty and the Bloodshed. Hi, David. I hope you like my theatrical sort of re- rendering. It was it was highly dramatic, I That's must it. say. Yes, right. uh, a, a suitable intro to these three exceedingly different films that we have today. But they're all pretty big movies, big releases, uh, big things for the holiday season, even although in very different ways. And uh, they're all out there. So let's talk about them. Uh, let us begin with The Fablemans. This is the new movie by the fabled Steven Spielberg. And it is a, I think, even though he is an extremely uh, personal filmmaker and has been making movies that I think resonate within his own soul for lo these many, many decades, uh, this is probably the most personal movie he has ever made uh, because it is semi-autobiographical. It is about the growing up of a boy and then a young adult very much like Spielberg himself. So it really is telling us things about his own life story. So very personal film for him. He co-wrote it with the very, very fine playwright, Tony Kushner. Uh, So he had some help with the screenplay. They they worked together on it, but it is very much very close to Steven Spielberg's own story. So we start off with a child and Spielberg is just a couple of years younger than I. And the movie begins with him going to see his very first first movie with his loving parents and his very first movie was the Cecil B. DeMille epic uh, The Greatest Show on Earth, a movie about circus life, which came out in 1952. That may have been, I don't think it was the first movie I ever saw, but it was certainly one of the first movies I ever saw when I too was a very little kid. So the movie begins with Steven Spielberg as a little, well actually his name is different in the movie, his name is Sammy Fableman uh, but he goes off and he sees this movie with his parents and he is awed by it, especially by the big train crash scene. And so then he begs his parents, will they please buy him a train set? And they do. And then he starts crashing the train set that they had bought him. And then he learns how to make a little eight millimeter movie of the crashing train. And this is, of course, the start of it all for Sammy Fableman, who is also in slim disguise, Steven Spielberg. So he learns the joys of movie making very, very early. And then he grows a little bit older and he goes everywhere with his camera. It turns out that his father also was an amateur movie maker around the house. And so young Sammy starts making movies with eight millimeter and eventually 16 millimeter. And he shows his movies to the kids in his uh, Boy Scout troop and then to the kids in his high school. And by the end of the movie, he has gotten out of high school and doesn't want to go to college because he just wants to be a movie maker. And that is it all very close to the experience of Steven Spielberg. In fact, it is so close that the early movies that we see Sammy making with his friends and relatives and his little tiny camera are very much like the kinds of early movies that the young Steven Spielberg made with his friends and family. Movies about World War II and, oh, different stuff like that. And he is clearly dedicated and gifted. And so he is uh, he is making his little movies and growing up to be Steven Spielberg. However, there are other things happening along the way. For example, during a family camping trip, through taking his movies and then looking at his little movies later on, getting ready to edit them, uh, the young, the very young Sammy Fableman realizes that his mother is having an affair with his father's very best friend who also works with him. And so that becomes a kind of a subplot in the movie. And we have this family drama. And this also presumably is true to life. Uh, as with the real Steven Spielberg, uh, Sammy Fableman's mother is a very gifted pianist who plays the piano professionally. His father is an electrical engineer. And then, yes, this affair is going on with the uncle. And so he discovers that and that causes great tension in the family. And for a while, it leads young Sammy to give up making his little movies. Although, of course, he eventually eventually gets back to it and becomes the fabled uh, Steven Spielberg. Although that all happens after the movie ends. Uh, The movie only follows us up through uh, when he is just on the very brink of becoming a full-blooded adult. 
uh, and uh, that's when we leave him behind. This is very much a movie about childhood. Well, childhood has always been Steven Spielberg's most favorite territory. Uh, of course, he has dealt with other phases of life in his movies and the occasional TV show that he's done, but he loves childhood. He is a very gifted and brilliant technician, Steven Spielberg is, but I am afraid that I have found that through most of his career, he has basically a 12-year-old mind. He is always making movies, sometimes excellent, brilliant movies, about childhood experience and about the kinds of things that children are interested in, even though he has long been an adult. So he's made excellent movies like Jaws and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He's made a lot of second-rate movies. He's made a lot of movies which strike me as just sort of spinning his wheels, uh, but mostly they do deal with either childhood things or the kinds of things that children are interested in, and that very much goes for the Fablemans as well. The cast is really, really fine. We have playing the parents. We have Michelle Williams, a wonderful actor. We have Paul Dano, a wonderful actor. In the role of that adulterous uncle, we have uh, Seth Rogen, who gives a terrific performance, I think. He's getting better and better as an actor. And all kinds of interesting people are in the movie. Dud Judd Hirsch has a very small but memorable appearance as, as an uncle, Uncle Boris. And the movie is also very much about the families being Jewish and about how young Sammy Fableman sometimes feels like an outsider because of this. It's a likable movie. It's an amiable movie. I found it bland. It's just not exciting. It's not thrilling. It's not funny. It's always entertaining, even at two and a half hours. You watch it unfold. I never really lost interest in it, but I have to say it never moved me very much. It never made me particularly laugh, particularly cry. It's really just a generally bland movie. I would say it's one of Steven Spielberg's blander movies. So yes, it's nice, it's entertaining. It's not doing very well at the box office. Uh, I think a lot of people are gonna see it and I think a lot of people are gonna enjoy it in a mild way because it's a mild movie. I wish it were more than that, but it just isn't. It's a second rate Steven Spielberg extravaganza. Our second movie today, Pinocchio, is also known as Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio because that great director, well, that great director, that very enterprising and uh, inventive director, has directed along with a second director named Mark Gustafsson, who is an animation specialist. Because Pinocchio is Guillermo del Toro and Mark Gustafsson's extravagant animated film made with stop motion animation. And I have to say here, Technically, it is absolutely superb. Is it the old Pinocchio story? It is indeed the old Pinocchio story. The same movie that was made into a sensational classic by the Disney studio decades and decades ago, and that of course originally comes from the, the, the story Pinocchio by, 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 by Collodi. Uh, it is very much that, but with twists. For one thing, it is updated to the World War II period. And so we have Pinocchio, as always, he is a puppet, who wants to become a real boy, uh, and he has been made by his father, Geppetto, who is a gifted wood carver and imbued with life by a supernatural sort of a fairy figure. And that's all very nice. But here, we have it in the World War II era, and it is in Italy, and so we have the fascist era going on. And so one of the challenges that Pinocchio faces, along with uh, wanting to become a real boy, uh, is the challenge of, of being drafted off to fight in the fascist army and this kind of thing. And by the way, he is very, very... Uh, uh, a great asset uh, to Mussolini and and, 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 and and company because it turns out he can't die. Uh, he's a puppet. He has not become a real boy. He is carved out of wood. No matter what happens to him, he never dies. Instead, he goes to this sort of in-between realm where he is... Uh, he, 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 communes with this supernatural figure who explains to him that he will keep returning back to the world as a more or less living puppet forever and ever and will never really die. Well, this makes him a very valuable soldier, of course. Now, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio is not all about the fascists. It's not all about Pinocchio not being able to die. It's partly about those things. Mostly it's about Pinocchio himself, who is a lovely, chirpy, optimistic creature who never sees any evil or any harm anywhere, which is pretty interesting when you're growing up in fascist Italy. Uh, so we have here a lot of human interest elements. Geppetto creates Pinocchio because his own son has been killed, in this case, by a bombing during World War II. Uh, and he loves the puppet Pinocchio, and the puppet Pinocchio loves him, and they have various adventures with various other people. And it's all just quite a lovely movie, very, very nicely done, very beautifully done. As animation goes, it's really just, just probably the best done 
technically done animation that I have seen in a very long time of any sort. Again, it is stop motion animation, so it has a lovely sort of a three-dimensional feel, even though it's a 2D movie. Uh, and Del Toro brings to bear all of his tremendous visual imagination. It's a bit too long at about two hours, uh, but it's just really so beautifully, just beautifully crafted in every possible way. The voice cast has all kinds of gifted people. Uh, oh my gosh, uh, Ewan McGregor, uh, the wonderful uh, Tilda Swinton, Ron Perlman, a frequent collaborator of Del Toro's, uh, Kate Blanchett, Christoph Waltz, Tim Blake Nelson, all kinds of terrific people are in it with just their voices, and it's a beautifully done movie, and I really think it's probably, probably, probably the year's best animated film. Pinocchio, it has a lot of warlike elements in it, and even though parts of it are old-fashioned Disney stuff. The songs, for example, I didn't find them very compelling. They're just sort of okay. Uh, so the old-fashioned Disney elements are all there, but it also has this darker tone because of its taking place during World War II and among the fascists. And that's an interesting element that maybe makes this not an appropriate movie for the very youngest kids, but for most age groups, it's really a very, very fine and beautifully done animation. Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, a good movie. And finally, Jill, today, our documentary. So we have had uh, a semi-autographical dramatic film uh, and then a, uh, an animated film, now our documentary to round out this extremely varied slate for today. This is the new documentary by the very gifted Laura Poitras, whose new movies include The Oath, which was about 9-11 and the aftermath, and Citizen Four, uh, which is about uh, Edward Snowden. Uh, they are very politically oriented documentaries. Well, her new film, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed at first appears to not be a very political film. It appears to be a sort of a biopic, a biographical documentary about the artist Nan Golden. Now, Nan Golden is best known, I think, to everybody and certainly best known to me uh, for a slideshow. She's basically uh, a photographer. That's her art form. And she did a slideshow many years ago called The Ballad of Sexual Dependency, a very adult uh, slideshow, as that, uh, that, that title suggests. And it's a very memorable and just beautifully done series of photographs. She is, I think, an extremely gifted photographer. And in the course of this new documentary about her, uh, Nan Golden, uh, you get to see a lot of Nan Golden's photographs, and they are wonderful and they are terrific. You also learn a lot about Nan Golden's life, and it has been a very unconventional, nonconformist kind of a life. Uh, she was very much into different kinds of sexuality. Uh, well, I shouldn't say was, still is. Uh, she is into very obviously developing her art as a photographer, often transgressing the norms of contemporary photography, trying new things, doing things that the art world wasn't ready for, but she made them ready for and broke barriers and did all all kinds of new things in her art form of photography. So all of that is in the movie. So we have her uh, adventurous sexuality. We have her adventurous, adventurous work as, as a photographer. We have all this in the movie, but then it turns out to be, yes, a very political movie as well, because she became a ferocious uh, opponent of the Sackler family and the whole opioid situation that has been going on and is still going on in recent years. The way that opioids created largely by the Sackler family and their huge big pharma outfit uh, took such a tremendous human toll. People getting addicted to opioids, moving on from opioids to other kinds of drugs, dying in droves, all those horrors. So Nan Golden became very, very uh, involved with the political move against the Sackler family to get their name removed from all of their their uh, 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 altruistic projects to all the museums and galleries to which they they contributed enormous amounts of money and art uh, getting their names removed that's a big theme of this movie and just getting their evil deeds publicized and all of this so all the beauty and the bloodshed is very much about this extremely political and still very urgent and relevant topic for all of us to think about so this movie by Laura Poitras about Nan Golden combines all these different things about Nan Golden. Nan Golden's personal life, her growing up, how she became an artist, her sexuality, her growth as a photographer, her breaking all kinds of boundaries as an artistic photographer, all of that is in here. And also all of this <clears throat> tremendous political dimension of Nan Golden's life, her getting involved in the fight against opioids, in the fight against the Sackler family and so forth and so on. All the Beauty and Bloodshed is a pretty darn long movie. It does not always sustain its dramatic interest, and it doesn't always tell you everything you want to know. Uh, when I came out of the movie, I had all kinds of questions that the movie had raised in my mind and had not really quite answered. Also, with 
cramming all these different things in Nan Golden's life, her art as a photographer, her political activity. It's kind of scattershot sometimes. It's constantly jumping among all these things. That said, it is always, always interesting, and it has a whole lot of human poignancy to it. I must say, Nan Golden, for example, had a sister who died of suicide, which helped to shape Nan Golden's own life. All of this is in there, and it's all pretty interesting, and it's an interesting and informative movie to watch. I wish it were a little bit more finely crafted. I wish it focused a little bit more on the life or the politics without kind of jumbling them up together quite as much as it does, but it's a very interesting movie, a very relevant movie, and I hope that a lot of people see it because it'll get a lot of people thinking about the opioid crisis which is still going on and about nan golden's excellent as a, excellence as a photographer which is also still going on so all the beauty and the bloodshed not a great movie but certainly one of this year's very best documentaries so that is my pretty darn varied story this week joe we will give you pretty darn varied david sterrett films in focus the films the fablemans pinocchio and all the beauty and the bloodshed 